Okay, well, good morning. We're going to begin our study here on the book of Judges, chapter 4 again. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful um, for this morning, for the time that we have that we can spend together opening your word. And we invite, Lord, your spirit uh, to guide and direct us. Help us to clearly see the things that are most important and to sort a truth from error. Uh, we pray for the people who are studying. May your spirit rest upon them. We know that there are many needs um, in people in this movement and people searching for truth. And we just pray, Lord, that you can bless each one. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. Just shut that window. But um, we're continuing this study in Judges chapter 4. And as we, because we've gone over this, but every time we look at it, we glean something more. And where we picked up, where we, where we need to pick up today is where we left off yesterday. And that had to do with, um, well, we were dealing with Sisera. We read through some of this, and I think we understand it at least on some level. Um, So remember that this chapter we're looking at, uh, it's representing the message that is counteracting that of Parminder. And Parminder's message we look at as a papal message. And this has to do not so much with the papacy itself, but what is the characteristic of the papacy that Parminder's movement characterizes? That it's copying. That we need someone to explain scripture to us. Okay, so so we need someone to explain because this is what we see Parminder really setting up in his organizational structure. Um, it wasn't so much about to accomplish tasks, which is really what organization is for. It's to get so that people can work together and things can be accomplished. And, and, and that was the problem that I had with the organization of Parminder is it was what I would call centralization and centralization in the sense of doctrine. So they had set up, you know, uh, uh, you know, the biblical research institute, whatever it was called, uh, the doctrinal analysis group or something like that you know it's sort of like uh in order for anybody to read anything we need the imprimatur of the pope upon this document so that's the type of organization that they were setting up they were setting up of course uh baptismal vows so that they could baptize people that they could organize churches but none of this was what i would call practical organization um, and, and I saw Tabo doing the same type of thing. He, he mostly was trying to exert authority and control over what was happening. That is, they didn't like the fact that people were coming up with ideas and influencing the movement that didn't come from them. That was really the problem. And that would be the papacy. And what had been happening in the movement for quite a long time was that the Holy Spirit was working upon the hearts of individuals and all kind of, kinds of light was being poured upon the movement. And it wasn't coming from the top down. And Jeff was really good at recognizing when light came and sharing it, even when he didn't always fully understand it. And he allowed all kinds of people to present and for, for those in the movement to judge for themselves whether something was true or not. But as Parminder came into the movement uh, and, and started to 
have his influence. His influence was really to shut down this work that the Holy Spirit was doing. So that when we talk about Jabin being the enemy, we have Sisera, of course, his general. Uh, I'm not suggesting that even though Jabin represents the papacy, it's more the papal spirit that, that's really being represented. Is that is that how we would look at it? I don't know that there's another way to look at it. Okay, now, so we're going to run into this this latter part dealing with JL and Heber. So we already addressed Heber, where I believe that this is specific, a specific part of the message, um, dealing with. Um, the application of these symbolic numbers for the J July 18, 2020 prediction. So we would say that uh, the message of Barak and Deborah is, is broader than that, but that it's specifically this Heber the Kenite um, who's going to be involved or this message that's going to be involved with July 18th. And, and, and again, we're not, we're not trying to pick out individual people, but we can see that individuals can be symbolized here in certain aspects of their message. So one of the things that, that I had addressed dealing with this one, two, nine, three, six number, which is, um, 77 times 168. So when we look at the Hebrew here, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do this. And it talks about Heber, right? He pitched his tent, and that word tent is um, 168 in, in the Hebrew, uh, Strong's Hebrews numbers. And so 168 is the number of hours in a week. And my home address was 12936, which is 168 times 77. And then Zanaim, he's in the plain of Zanaim, to me would be like 65 streets. Zanaim, the gematria for that is 65. So, so it's, it's pointed to something very specific, a symbolic use of numbers. And the symbolic use of numbers has to do with the hours in a day and also gematria. So these are part of the, uh, the analytical tools that God has given us and that we have applied to July 18th. And then also I had noticed this number, 12936 days, um, going from the time of the end, February 15th, 1798, to July 18th, 1833, which is in July 18th, 1833, the year in which uh, the message is formalized, is 187 years to the day to July 18, 2020. So if that's significant, I mean, to me, that's not something that would be very likely to be by chance. And so I would, I would say that this is representing that this number is important. And it's connected to July 18, 2020, and it ties the time of the end in Millerite history to the July 18, 2020 prediction. And so we can see that here in Judges chapter 4. Now, it's, it's rather obscure for many people. You know, somebody watching this video who knows very little about this message would just think it's kind of silly. You know, it's really a stretch. But we can see that this isn't just a main argument. This is something that um, we've already established in so many different ways um, that this is just a detail. It, it's almost, in a sense, a trivia, um, except that we're noticing it at a certain time, and so it becomes something interesting to us. But we would never use it as, as a main argument of something. And we can't make it into something that it's not. And, and I always want to emphasize this point that, you know, we don't really have people being represented. It's the messages that are given at this time. So you can't then attach, 
well, this person is this, so this is going to happen. And uh, because the message is given by people, but it's given by lots of different people. And so the symbols can be tied to different people at different times. So they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinuam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. Now, Mount Tabor, we know, is um, uh, it's going to be east of Nazareth, the city of Nazareth. It's not mentioned in the New Testament. It's only mentioned in the Old Testament. They say it takes about an hour, an hour and a half to get to the top of it. You know, when we think about a mountain, there's, I mean, when I think about mountains living in Alberta, I mean, there's not many mountains I can climb that would take an hour to an hour and a half. So, so these aren't really mountains in the sense of how I think of a mountain, but they are mountains. So they're large hills. And, uh, but what, what does this Mount Tabor represent? How do we understand this as a symbol? Like why, why are they going up to Mount Tabor? What is attached to Mount Tabor as a symbol? Are mountains governments? Well, mountains can be governments. So, so this could be some kind of leadership or authority in where, where this battle is occurring. What other symbols can we apply to mountains? Well, they also can be religious symbols. They can represent worship. Because the idea of a mountain is that um, it connects earth to heaven. You know, like the Mount of Transfiguration, they climb up onto a mountain, right? And there you see the kingdom of God. So it can represent... Um, definitely a government, it can also represent a kingdom, but it also can be tied to religious worship as well. Okay, now, as we look at this in the in the verses that we were going over last, yeah, of course, we have Heber the Kenite, who was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law or brother-in-law of Moses. That's his brother-in-law, as we found out, yeah had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent under the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kadesh. Mm -hmm. And you were, you were pointing out that this Kadesh is Kadesh Barnea? No, this is Kadesh Naphtali. Kadesh it, Naphtali. Yeah, it mentions this earlier. Okay. And they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. Is this the Kenites that are showing that to Barak that Sisera had gone to Mount Tabor? Or is this the, fa the family of, of Heber that's showing them this? And this we can't know. Right, because Hebrew doesn't tell us uh, who the they is. That is, this could be any they. Right, it could be just... Some people that they, you know, Cicero runs into um, because it doesn't follow just because you have a, a personal pronoun that it, that it has to follow anybody that was mentioned before. So, so that I, I'm just saying here, we can't know. And, and I don't see in the spirit of prophecy where she clarifies this or anything. So. So I have no way of knowing. Is all I'm trying to say. Okay, but we're dealing with Sisera. Yeah, so Sisera, he's uh, he's going to be shown that Barak, the son of Obinum, was gone up to Mount Tabor. Now, if you're going to say that this is, um, so this is going to be a place of a battle of some sort, right? Right, and, this, and the battle seems to be over authority. Definitely. Yeah. Now, could we place this as August 29th, 2019? 
could we place this at where they're going to have uh, the meeting there where in, in Germany, where Stephen Odilio and John Mark are going to be arrayed before this tribunal? Could be. Okay. Because this is this is the defeat of Sisera, and um, that's where I would place it. But because that's what I'm going to understand Mount Tabor to represent. But I don't know if if everyone would agree with that. If Tabor would represent what? I was looking at something else. Well, Tabor would represent this, that um, series of meetings there in Germany. Place. And, and so, I mean, the question is where was, where was Parminder defeated? Where was his message defeated? Right, and that to me would seem to be the place. That's where the battle takes place. Now, there were some interesting things about Germany, because most people know Odilio, when he heard about this meeting that they are going to have to have with Parminder and Tabo and all and Tess and all that, uh, he went in the woods to pray. And when he did so, he asked for some kind of sign that God was with him. And he looked up and there was a, a birdhouse with the number 187 written on it. On, on the front of it, I believe, and on the bottom, I, I have the picture of it. Um, and this to him was a sign that, uh, you know, he should stand his ground on July 18th. So, so I look at the battle of July 18th of that message um, as, ha ha as occurring there in Germany. So when it says Cicero gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Herosheth of the Gentiles unto the river of Kishon. And... And Deborah said unto Barak, Up for this day, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. So we have these 900 chariots and 10,000 men. So, and of course, uh, Sisera is going to have um all these people that he's gathered together which they don't give a number of so what would be what uh, i mean we need to be able to understand that what this symbolism is we need to be able to put it into some kind of structure maybe maybe i'm not on on track on how i'm trying to look at this but we know that 10,000 men, one of the things that Odilio showed us is that the number of people can represent the number of days. So where would we take this 10,000 and how would we place it in the context of everything that we've been talking about? Well, if we look at 10,000 as a number of days, 
we'd almost be looking at 27 and three quarter years. Yeah. If we were looking at that as a prophetic length of time. Right. So that's, yeah. So if we did it in prophetic time, it would be 27 years, 280 days. Um, and if we put it into uh, just our actual sort of time, uh, it would be 27 and yeah, it would be well point. So it would be stay on a second here. Yes, it would be 27 years and 138 days, roughly. <clears throat> so whatever that means. It would be like four months and, you know, 15 days or something on top of that 27 years. So... So I don't know. I don't know how to to address that part of it. Um, but we have these 900 chariots as well. So, you know, we're struggling here to try to figure out there must be something that we haven't noticed. I would think. Okay, so if we go, so let's just try something here. Um, if we go to November 9th, 1989, and we count 10,000 days, we come to March 27th, 2017. Now, is that significant? So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm just going to the start of our line, the time of the end. And I'm going to count 10,000 days. And it comes to March 27th, 2017. Is March 27th, 2017 significant in relationship to Parminder? So Iran says yes. Okay, so can you explain the significance of it? Iran. Uh, it's just a significant number, March 27th. Um. Okay, so it's a significant date because it's a symbol of the message of the Levites. Now, we have a March 27th, 2019, right? So that March 27th, 2019 is the center of the two dates of October 13th and November 9th, 2019. So October 13th, 2018. So we have that center of that structure. <coughs> Excuse me. It's the center of the Levitical chiasm that uh, begins with this 126 days and ends with 126 days, right? <clears throat> now, 2017 itself, what is 2017? Okay, so it's a symbol of raphia because of 217. It's just a symbol of July 27th, right? So that's, is that what you're trying to say there? Yeah. Okay, now we also know that it's, it's when we look at organization. So even though Parminder's ordained back in 2016, they're going to have their first organizational uh, camp meeting in um, Romania in September of 2017. But a lot of organizational things are going to be going on in 2017. 2017 is an extremely pivotal year. It's also the year that's the center of the structural chiasm uh, dealing uh, with uh, the Mayan calendar and the 
the 777s. Seven, seven, so there's four periods of 777. Seven, seven. And we have it going from December 21st, 2012, which is uh, a date that's exactly center between two dates that Jeff had noted. That is June 22nd, 2011, when he receives $165,000 to start the School of the Prophets in a singular check. And then when they have the first uh, camp meeting in Arkansas on June 22nd, 2014. So December 21st, 2012 is exactly the center of those two dates. And it starts a structure of 777 days, uh, which is all connected to the symbolism of July 18th. And it ends with my, my 52nd birthday on February 16th, that first 777 days. And it's divided from the day of my birth to May 9th, 2014, which is 18,720 days. So that would be 52 years of 360 days. And then 20, 273 days later is my 52nd birthday. So we have a structure that's the same as the structure that we have in our regular 777 days from November 9th. And then we have 777 days from my 52nd birthday to March 24th, 2017. So it doesn't reach to March 27th, 2017. But how many days from March 24th to March 27th? Three days. Right. So three days. And three days is a symbol. Now, March 24th, 2017 is the 25th day of the 12th month on the biblical calendar. So it's also a symbol that ties us to our regular 777 days. But we can see that March 27th is a symbol of the Levites. And I think that that's how we would have to apply in this application of this. Because I'm not saying that Judges chapter 4 is only written just to represent our movement. But it is written for us in a way that we can understand it, that it gives us information about what has happened in this movement. And so I would think that we would have to take this 10,000 days and, and apply it that way. So I, I'm going to draw this out for people because I know that everybody can just visualize this. So, oops, I'm going to have to erase the board here. So hang on a sec. Okay, we have all of these things, and I know we're familiar with them. Not everybody's necessarily convinced about all of this, but we know we have 777 days here. And this is November 9th, 2019. This is December 25th, 2021. And the division of this, we have 252, 252, and 273. This is March 27th, 2021. And this is July 18, right? I know it's kind of tiny to read, but July 18. So we, we know that part. And we know that <clears throat> September 23rd, 2017, is also a period of 777 days before November 9th. And this is where Jill, this is Lambert. And this is the symbol of July 18th as the PBM. So <clears throat> that happens to be 777 days. So when I noticed this, I wanted to see if there was any connection to this December 21st, 2012 date. So this was the Mayan calendar. And this is 
872,000 days from the start of the Mayan calendar on August 11th. We're writing this uh, the Gregorian way because that's a Gregorian date in 3113. So that would be 3114 BC. So this is actually September 7th, 3114 BC. But this is how you would write it as a Gregorian date. And that's where I first saw it. And there's a whole story behind this. But <clears throat> I then noticed that if I went back to my birthday, February 6th, 1963. Well, actually, I didn't notice that first. What I noticed is that I could go 777 days from this date. And it came to my birthday in 2015. And that's, I'm going to be 52. And if you take 360 times 52, it, you get 18720. So, but this is my actual 50, 52nd birthday, which is 365 and a quarter times 52, which if I do that, I get 189 nine three days so that's how many days then from my birthday here one eight nine nine three but that means the difference between here is 273 so then i know that we have 273 days here and this span of time is one eight seven two zero and this date is exactly center, as I said, between the June 22nd dates in 2011 and 2016 that Jeff had noted. Is it 2011? No, 2011 and 2014, pardon me. So in 2014, so you have June 22nd, 2011, and June 22nd, 2014. And this date is the center of it. And so you can see that Jeff, by marking those two dates, was already marking July 18, 2020 as a symbol because he was marking this. And we already had this 777 chiasm, right? So now we have this other 777 days that ends up March 24th, 2017. And we now have this date here, which is 10,000 days. So I'll just write here 273, 10,000 days from the time of the end. So I know it's a little bit messy, but can we see that this must be the, this must be addressing this history? And this history is going to be going uh, right here from 2012 to 2019 at least if not further. Does that make sense to people? Anybody have questions about that? That's something they don't understand. It's got a logical pattern to it. But I would think then we would have to say that this 10,000 days, this is where we would primarily have to apply it. In this time period. Right, in this time period. In, in this application, I don't see that we can do anything else with this 10,000 days. And, and this makes the most sense in the context of what what, how we're looking at this. Now from the chat, Tabor could, could relate to this. Okay. I'm not yeah, I didn't, trying to figure that out. Okay. So Rand says the normal product that is, you're taking the letters of the word Tabor, T being um, 
20, et cetera, et cetera. And that's going to give you 10,800 if you multiply Tabor together. And 10,800, there's um, 1,080 minutes in an hour. So 10,800 is 10 hours. So what would be the significance of 10 hours? Thinking. Well, Rand says it's similar to 10,000, okay, which is correct. It is similar. It's not the and same. 10 hours would also be uh, 0.416667 of a day. So, well, just be six repetent of a day. Point six, 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 et cetera. Continue on. Okay. Is there another way that we could look at this? Hmm. Well, I mean, if we took the 800 and we added it on to the 10,000, it would bring us to June 5th, 2019. I don't know if anything happened on June 5th, 2019 relating to Parminder. Another, co another comment from the chat gives relation to Acts 27, 28 in the 15 fathoms being 10,080. Right, which is the number of, of minutes in an hour. And um, we have the 20, 000, 20 fathoms as well. And when you add the two together, you get 2520. So, um, so we have these symbols here. So I don't know if we would say that there's something on June 5th, 2019. It's not something that I particularly know about what was happening with other people in 2019. But it but it does anyway, it does bring us to this history of whether we use Tabor in that way. The 10,000 brings us to the history of this organizational structure of Parminder. It brings us to the year 2017. So I think that was where we had primarily look at it, whether we're going to take this gematria of, of Mount Tabor, um, and and apply that or not i don't know so just going to go back to this scripture here but this would be a battle so this is a battle in organization but we're going to get to this very specific event So Sisera gathered together all the chariots. Um, it means to assemble, call together, make a cry out, come with such a company, gather together, um, announce or convene publicly. Um, it, it comes from a Can this also be a symbol? Yeah. Can this also be a symbol of a false loud cry? Well, yeah, and it's it 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 comes from a word that means to shriek from anguish or danger. So I would think it is a a false loud cry. It's a false message. But when he's going to gather together, he's going to use these chariots, and these are chariots of iron. Now, there are 900 chariots of iron. So 
So I don't know what that particularly would mean. I still haven't figured out what this 900 is. I mean, we've had some analysis of it. But in the context of Parminder, I mean, maybe it's the, the, you know, the number 45 somehow is related to that. But that doesn't really seem to be his main message. His main message isn't about Trump. He used the message of Trump, the part that uh, Jeff had brought. Um, but that's not something that originated with Parminder. If we add the 900 to the 10,000, that brings us to September 13th, 2019. And September 13th, 2019 is uh, six days after Jeff had uh, challenged um, Parminder with the presentation on September 7th. So I don't know if that means anything. So I'm just showing you what, what, what we could do. Whether that means anything, I don't know. But um, I don't know if I would take the chariots and just count them as days. We have the 10,000, so it brings us to 2017, to organization. And it seems to me that that's the characteristic or the characterization of Parminder's movement is a gathering together under a papal banner. That is, he's calling this movement... To, to come under a banner that is contrary to the gospel. This is definitely a counterfeit message. And but so if this, is, if this is a shrieking, is this also not the type of cry when one is losing control that they think they should have. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I and I look at at what Parminder did as, I mean, he definitely wasn't in control. He things didn't happen the way that he expected, and the only thing he could do was tighten his control because that's all he had, and. And he sort of won that battle in a certain sense, um, but really he lost it, right? Because, I mean, he ended up with way more people on his side than Jeff had on his side, so to speak. But his message just goes nowhere. I mean, he didn't get everything that he wanted. He didn't get the School of the Prophets. And he wasn't able to defeat his enemies. And it, really, Parminder was defeated. So they go into the river Kaishan, right? So how did we look at Kaishan again? It's a winding. It's like a trap. It's like a snake or a serpent. We were uh, the comment that I brought up was does this have some relation to the banner of Dan, that of a backbiter? Right. So so we can see there that that this has been the method of Parminder. It was this behind the scenes secret meetings, character assassination. He was not attacking. He wasn't looking at things in an open way to understand them. And allowing people to make their own decisions. Instead of addressing what somebody was saying, he would use this uh, uh, attack. And we saw that with Chowatu. So Parminder tells a completely false story about his encounter with Chowatu. And of course, he's victorious in that way, right? I mean, he defeats Chowatu. But. Um, and sadly, Chow too wasn't able to to deal with that. Right, because people take things personally, which they should never do. 
but but we can see that that was how he dealt with it and he misrepresented what chow Tu was saying and he never looked at it and he never wanted other people to look at it in any sort of honest and open way so that's the type of deceit the backbiting that goes on and and we can relate it to dan so we know that we can use the numbers of the tribe of dan um to represent uh, things addressed with this history. So I'm not gonna go into all of those numbers again. The one thing we can say, I'll just show you one, is that from August 15th, 1844, if we take the number of the tribe of Dan from Numbers 26, 64,400 days, it brings us to December 10th, 2020. And I don't know if we actually address this too much. Um, here, I'll bring this up here. So these are just, because I hadn't sorted through all of these yet. Um, so September, so I have this here just on the bottom, September 11th, 1816, this is Miller, uh, the two year anniversary when he's converted and he's going to begin his study of the Bible. And two years later, by 2018, he's going to uh, come to his understanding of 1843. Um, and then we got 10,200 days to August 15th, 1844. And both this September 11th, 1816, this is the number, Judah's number one, goes to December 10th, 2020. And also from August 15th, 1844, it brings us to December 10th, 2020. So does anybody know the significance of December 10th, 2020? Well, we know it's four days after the declaration on December 6th. Isn't that the day that they, they were continuing to remove a lot of us from the access to their chats and, and other things? Yeah, it was. But also, it's the date, it's the dated letter that you had wrote to uh, Bronwyn and Jason. It was December 10th, 2020. That's the date you have on that letter. So I don't know if you remember that, Dwight. I just have to look back. Yeah. Anyway, I have your letter. You emailed it to me. And uh, it's dated December 10th. So, so we can see that this backbiting was also an element that continued in FFA. They, they followed the same spirit of Parminder in how they were dealing with uh, the disappointment of July 18, 2020. So again, they failed to follow the counsel that God had given us. So, <clears throat> so the symbol of Dan, the serpent, the adder that biteth at the heels, right? That is what we see as part of this spirit of this movement uh, of Cicero, of Parminder. So when we look at the next verse, Judges 4.14, And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out from before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. Right, so we're going to, again, the 10,000 we'll just take as that same period of time. It's just part of that symbol pointing out for our movement that this is uh, dealing with this organization. And Barak goes down from Mount Tabor. 
That is, this message, the message relating to chronology, has separated itself from this, this organizational structure. So before, we were trying to support um, Parminder, right? I mean, Stephen was supportive of Parminder. He thought Parminder would accept the message of July 18. But now we're going to see that, that this battle, um, instead of being on the territory, so to speak, of, of the enemy, it, it takes a turn. And we know the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled on his feet. Now, can we see this as a characterization of the conflict between these two messages? Does this seem appropriate for Parminder's message and this other message that, that we have dealing with chronology, also with July 18th, but that it ends up defeating Parminder and his message? Does this seem like a good characterization of it? Yes. Okay. Now, when it says he fled away on his feet, how would we understand this? So to fl fled away, fled away is from a word noose, which means to flit, that is vanish away. Uh, would that characterize what happened to Parminder? Has Parminder's movement been able to do anything in regard to this movement? Do we see them still discussing with us is there any kind of interaction with Parminder or did his movement just disappear from our perspective? I mean, I know they still exist. He seems to have gone off into his corner and a lot of us are just not paying attention to what he has to say. Well, it's hard to even find much of what he has to say. I mean, you have to really look for it. But what happened is all the people who were in Parminder's movement, they all defriended me or blocked me on Facebook. None of them would respond to emails. Even, even right after it happened, none of them would respond. You don't encounter them anywhere. Now, that might not be true for some people. There might be people who still have contact with some of them uh, because they have really close friends in that movement. But they're basically vanished from the face of the earth, as far as I'm concerned, and definitely with their influence in this movement, other than that they have some people who are sympathizers with the principles uh, that they have, you know, that Parminder had or has, um, in how they deal with things. And some people are still using the same methods. But, but otherwise, he's fled away. Now, he lighted down from off his chariot. So, I mean, we've already addressed chariot. All right, so it's just basically a chariot, also a seat in a vehicle. And he lighted down from off it. That word there means to descend, literally go downwards. Uh, or conventionally, to a lower region as a shore, boundary, the enemy, etc. So he's 
lighted off of his chariot. It, it also can mean to be um, to go down, come down, to sink, to be prostrated, to come down, to bring down, to send down, to take down, to be brought down, to be taken down. Depends on, on the Hebrew forms, but um, But it says, but Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Harasheth of the Gentiles. And all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. Albeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber. The Kenite. For there was peace between Jabe and the king of Hazor and the house of Heber, the Kenite. So what would this be here? In the context of all the things that we've said so far, how would we look at this verse? Because who is Jael that went out to meet Sisera? Jael was the wife of Heber, right? Yeah. So it has to do with the church. Usually a woman represents a church. Right. So the church of the house of Heber. Yep. And what was the definition we we gave to Heber? Um, well, it, um, it means a community. Um, is the prime or a comrade? Relates to a society. So So something happened here, and and this is why I'm saying that this is going to relate specifically to um, what happened in August 29th. Twenty nineteen. At least that's how I would look at it. I want people to sort of think it through. Okay, so Sisera knows of the alliance between his master and the house of Heber. This is not Sisera's alliance. It is Jabin's alliance. Right. And that is that Heber has peace with Jabin. Right. Now, that means that Heber, if we are looking at this symbolically in the manner we've already been approaching it, Heber has peace with the papacy. Well, yeah, but we're not saying the papacy, it's this papal spirit. Okay, this papal spirit. Right, this, this way of doing things. Is it a way of doing things or a, a method of study? I don't, I don't think it's so much the method of study, though that, that's part of it um, in the sense of, but I think Cicero is more, um, about the method of study, but the method of study is not really the issue. It has to do with this papal spirit, this way of controlling things that I think is the major issue in this context. Um, and, and the answer to that is a correct me method of study that exposes uh, 
this this aspect of the movement it goes contrary to it it's outside of the bounds of parminder's control So, I mean, the way that I would look at it is jail represents those who have accepted July 18th. Prior to, you know, September 7th. So in a sense, it's a church or community that has been studying uh, this message. The message of Heber. Okay, now is it is it just those that have accepted july 18th or is it those that are accepting the path of palmoni well well both but but specifically jl is and and this spike in the temples um i think is is july 18th but you know maybe that's just me focusing on on that one aspect but because i look at barack as a message dealing with palmoni with this method of study right but now we have this specific thing and and it's this house then or this tent of uh of jail the wife of heber so it's a specific address so to speak which which i have attached to the one two nine three six symbolism so we're not talking again about a person or a literal place. We're talking about a symbol. And it's not going to be Heber that's going to be, bring about the death of Sisera or even Barak. It's going to be this woman. And she does it with this nail, right, this spike. Right. And you're going to see the message of um, when you when you look at this here. So when we read and jail went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, turn in, my Lord, turn in. So this is a doubling, right? Agreed. Turn in unto me, fear not. And when he had turned in into her tent, she covered him with a mantle. Or a rug. Or a rug or coverlet, a thick coverlet. Hmm. So I don't know specifically what this would mean, the mantle. Well, Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I could be off off track here on how I'm looking at this, but what are the different ways we could look at a mantle? I mean, it's it's being presented here as being a rug, a blanket. It's a covering of some type in order to try to hide right, Cicero. Right, because she covers him. So, to me when I look at at how Stephen was addressing the issue of July 18th. Um, he definitely had this sympathy with Parminder. It wasn't until August 29th that Stephen even had an inkling that there was something wrong. And isn't this the case with JL? Right. He has to discover really who she even had, who she was even protecting. She didn't think that there was anything wrong in the situation because Sisera looked to her to be just a a common soldier. Right. And this would be the way that, that Stephen was seen. Right. You understand what I'm saying? That I was singled out as an enemy. But Stephen and Odilio had not been. Right. And, and they were seen as dis my disciples who had been deceived by me. 
that's the way that they well, were, were addressed. You've been deceived by Theodore. He's uh, that, uh, whatever that guy's name is, um, the magician guy in the New Testament. I can't think of the name. But anyway, Simon. Simon. Yeah, Simon Magus, right? So this was what they, because they really wanted Parmender wanted. Uh, Odilio and and Stephen and John Mark uh, to recant. You know they never made any such uh, appeal to me. Okay, so oh. uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to back up for a second. Okay. Is it possible at that point that you were representative of Daniel? Stephen, Odilio, and John Mark were representative of the three friends that were cast into the fire. Yes. So Daniel's not even at uh, the celebrations there on the plains of Jura. Right. Mm -hmm. But you have these three now that are being brought before the leader, quote unquote. And the leader is basically saying, recant or bow down, or you're going to be cast out. Mm -hmm. So is that not just another symbol? Here is, here is Parminder. He is erecting his golden image in relation to how he wanted control and he doesn't get what he wants as far as the um the worship mm -hmm. you know and 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 stephen and odilio and john mark they're definitely a lot more meek than i am right they wouldn't have been seen as a threat Okay. Right. So, which jail is not seen as a threat to Cicero? Well, jail, because jail is the wife of Heber. Yeah. And because there is peace between Cicero's employer, Cicero's king. Yeah. And that house, jail would not have been seen as a threat. And jail did not see this quote common soldier unquote as a threat right so he asks for water she gives him milk why well milk is the sincere milk of the word but is it better than the living water no, but in the, in the context here, um, because he wasn't he wasn't interested in the water. I mean, it doesn't say it that way, but I would just say that <clears throat> what Stephen was trying to do, and Odilio and John Mark, is is they were trying to instruct him. I don't know, put to sleep by milk. Well, it's kind of true, so. So this milk, um, so he's thirsty. She doesn't give him water. She gives him milk. So the message that was being given um, <clears throat> to Sisera um, doesn't, doesn't really revive him. I mean, it puts him to sleep. I don't know. I mean, there's there's obviously a symbol here, but that's the way I would look at milk, as it has to do with God's word. Where the the water is the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's it's the gospel in in a different sense. It's a different symbol. I mean, it just you know we're starting to get down to this really sort of. <clears throat> very precise way of looking at these things 
um, and it definitely fits, but it just seems a little bit odd that we can we can take this story from Judges chapter four and we can focus it upon an event that happened using this symbolism. But it's not so much a story as it is an example for us. Yeah. So when I, when I look at a story, I look at something that is a, it, it just, it, it's something there. And I don't know if I, if I always see edification from a story, but for an example here, there's an edification for us within this movement as to what we should be looking at. And as we, as we continue here and then in the next chapter, there's so much that we're going to wind up needing to address figuratively that I don't think has ever been figuratively addressed before. Yes. Okay. So, I, I just find it amazing, though, is, is all I can say. I mean, we're, we're reading about us here in this context. And that's what I mean by a story. It's, it's something that happened. And it's now being symbolically represented here in Judges chapter 4. So and as we're going through this, in Judges 4.18. Yeah. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, turn in my Lord, turn in to me, fear not. Mm -hmm. Now, is Jael representing not just a church, but a righteous church at this? Because fear not is something, is a phrase that we find Christ using many times throughout scripture. Mm -hmm. And this is an invitation to, not just to Parminder as an individual, but, but to, to those people following Parminder. To that portion of the movement. Yeah. And definitely we have, uh, it's, it's a specific message. It's the midnight cry, turn in, turn in. And, and this covering is to conceal him. Now, often a covering can be referring to, um, you know, like a protection as well. But he turns in unto her tent, right? And so this tent we're using is a symbol of a, me a specific message. And, and definitely um, Stephen presents this message to Parminder, right? He wants Parminder to see July 18th. And it's a message specifically tied to me, right? So it's, um, that's the way that it's understood. July 18th is Theodore's uh, error or doctrine for those that are opposed to it. But even those that support it, they recognize where it came from and and they know that it that I'm attached to it. So, um, but they want to present this message to Parminder. But there's already been all of this undermining of me as a person. But Odilio and Stephen and John Mark, they're not seen as a threat. But they're still going to give this message. So, if I use if I use another type of term. Is July 18th, could that be considered as your magnum opus? I don't know about my magnum opus, but it is definitely uh, the thing that for me personally uh, was something that developed over a period of years. And so I'm definitely tied to it. I'm tied to it because of the prediction before midnight, Samuel Snow's letters. I mean, I first saw it as a symbol, you know, back in 2014. Uh, dealing with, um, in the chronology, understanding 
that it's 187 days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. Um, and so it's a symbol that kept showing up. And finally, we put it in its placed it correctly uh, in the casket uh, because we saw what it what it was. And, and it's the thing that I've mostly had to defend in this movement. I've had to defend a lot of things, the 2520 and the four, seven times and so forth. But it's definitely the one that um, uh, is tied to me, right? There's no one else that it's tied to. Especially when it comes to any, any people in Parminder's movement. They would see it as the great error that came from Theodore, that deceived Jeff, etc. And so the point there? Well, at this point, what we're doing is a great examination. Mm -hmm. We're looking at a great examination of the elements of July 18th and how it has been applied within the movement. Now, as we're dealing with this, JL has the doubling, turn in, turn in, fear not. Yeah. He, Sisera, asks for water, she gives him milk. Yeah. And then covers him. And then uh, from the cover, he says, stand in the door of the tent, mm -hmm. and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, is there any man here that thou shalt say no? Right. So I want you to lie for me. Yes. I want you to become part of this lie. So she figures out that this is not a common soldier. Yeah. She figures out that there's something more going on here than she initially thought. Right. And this is what happened to Stephen and Odilio and John Mark. Right. He's really being exposed there in, on August 29th. But JL takes a nail of the tent. Right, so nail of the tent, and that's what I'm trying to say, uh, because the tent we're going to use to symbolize the my message. message, right? My message, specifically because it's attached to my house, my house address. Okay, and and this nail of the tent would have to be uh, this message of July 18. At least that's the way that I would look at it. But what's the hammer? Okay. So the hammer is, um, well, it's used to put the nail in. So it would be the presentation of this message. And, and we see this with Odilio and Stephen. So they're going to go to Arkansas, and they're going to lay out all of this Palmoni relating to July 18th, right? They're going to go there in, in October. They're going to be there for a couple of months anyway, right? Can't remember Please how long. Don't. Yeah, I mean, I go there for a, a few days because I'm there from November seventh uh, to eleventh. I fly in on the seventh and I leave on the eleventh. But but they're they're quite a bit before me and they're quite a bit after me. They, they're asked to stay on even longer. Um, so I would look at that as being, uh, part of what's, what's being represented here, but it, it could even start earlier. So, um, you mean a ha hammer, it means a perforator that is a hammer as piercing. Um, so. Makebeth is the word in Hebrew. Um, uh, 
to means to puncture, right? To bore through, to pierce, to strike. Uh, okay, Jeremiah twenty three twenty nine. Do you want mm -hmm. me to read it? Well, I know I can. It says, "Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces." Right. It's like a pick. Yeah. So this is a different word, but anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but but and that means to pound. So this one is more like a hole, like something that pierces where this other one is is used to break things in pieces. So uh, so it's a different thing, but but we can still sort of apply it. But here there's this piercing that goes on. Now, when we think of a piercing, what do we think of primarily? I think of Christ being pierced. Yeah. And we know that this word here, this nail, um, uh, this is like a pin or a stake or a peg. Um, and this is Isaiah 22, 22. Uh, and actually Isaiah 22 and 23, right? 22, verse 22 and 23, which is quoted in, um, in Revelation. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder and he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open and i will fasten him as a nail in a sure place and he shall be for a glorious throne to my father's house right so this nail in a sure place this sure place is the sanctuary and and this is also referenced in hebrews uh, chapter six and ezra nine eight um and we have an anchor of the soul that word anchor is the the word nail both sure and steadfast and entereth into that within the veil whither the forerunner for us has entered even jesus made an high priest forever after the order of melchizedek so so this has to do with the message of the sanctuary as well and does july 18th is it a message of the sanctuary How, do, how does July 18th relate to the message of the sanctuary? Um, how can you erect a sanctuary without having an understanding of exactly how it is to be constructed. Yeah. And, and we know from Millerite history, um, our main line goes from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, that period of 187 days. And we have Samuel Snow's last letter on July 18th. I mean, when we start to look at July 18th as a symbol, it's not it's not just a message about a date of what's going to happen. It's actually a more complete message than that. That is, it ties together all kinds of truths, just like the 2520 does. And in fact, they're really part of the same message. So the message of July 18th is a message about God constructing a church preparing a people, a movement, both in Millerite history and in our history. And so we can see here this nail of the tent, which we're going to say is July 18. 
is more than just the prediction about July 18. This is really about the gospel. A message to the church. And the enemy is going to be defeated. The false understanding is going to be defeated. Is it that the false understanding is going to be defeated or the false applications are going to be defeated? Well, yeah. Yeah, the, because we're Seventh-day Adventists. And, and we've been given an heritage through the spirit of prophecy. But we have also have a, a system of understanding around the spirit of prophecy that has... Guarded it maybe isn't the best word, but uh, guarded it from really understanding what Ellen White is saying. Right. Similar to what the Jews had when it came to the Bible. Because the Jews could not read the Bible spiritually. They couldn't understand the message of the Bible. And we have the same problem with the spirit of prophecy. We've limited what Ellen White is saying. We can't, we just look at it as a devotional literature. She doesn't speak with any kind of authority, especially in the area of chronology or, or biblical interpretation, right? I mean, she, we might take her spiritual lessons from what she wrote, as from God, but her application of the scriptures is just is just that. It's just her understanding the scripture in a certain way. And she's not a scholar, so she's she doesn't understand the Hebrew and the Greek. She doesn't understand history. She doesn't understand chronology. Uh, you know, God inspired her in some way, but it's more de a devotional inspiration. That's the way Adventists look at the spirit of prophecy. And we can't even look at history. We can't look at, at our church's history and understand what it means. And Parminder, his message is just the message of liberal Adventism because he doesn't accept the spirit of prophecy except when he can use it to his devices. Right? Because she's just a woman who wrote in the United States in the 19th century, and we can interpret her writings in, in some way, the Parminder would use her writings, but he doesn't take what she says on the surface as valid. And we take everything that she says, just like we take the Bible, we know that any light that comes to us can never contradict the plain teachings of Scripture or the plain statements in the spirit of prophecy. And the message of July 18th brings us back to the spirit of prophecy. I mean, this whole message, this whole movement is, is a validation of not just the history of Adventism, that the foundation was laid correctly but that Ellen White is a prophet that has to be listened to. That she is correct in what she says, even when it contradicts man's opinions. And that's one thing we see as we study. We see that Ellen White notices details and she gets them right. When sometimes she has no reason to get them right if she was just a woman writing and copying other people's books. She would have be full of all kinds of contradictions because there's all those books have all different kinds of opinions. So 
So I still think that this, this work of attacking the message of Sisera is continuing. But I really think that specifically we have to go back to what happened on July 29th. And that's going to lead to um, where we are today. Now, can we take um, these this history here, uh, these verses? So when we go back and we look at the history of this movement, can we take these verses as referring to years, at least in partly? Or, or do we need to? Because, I mean, to me, when I look at this, this part specifically, um, um, you know, so parts of these things, I guess I can look at these verses as referring to years. I can't look at every one of them. But remember, we go to, to, to 2023. And so God subdued on that day the Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. And, and I'm saying that by 2023, that has to happen in this movement. That that papal influence, the papal method of addressing people who differ with us, has to be removed from the movement. I know there's a lot of silence, a lot of thinking about this, but 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 I think this progression that you see uh, in this chapter has to be addressing uh, this history. Is this a zoom in to what we were addressing regarding Judges 2? Yeah, that, that's the way that I would look at it. So we would have a, a particular portion of Judges 2 where this is a, not just a, a repeat and enlarge, but it's an expansion of further information of that which we had seen from Judges 2. Yeah, that's the way that I look at it. And it's addressing this particular issue, this particular enemy that judges chapter 2, because it goes to verse 23. And, and I think it's here that we see that end of Sisera. Now, of course, we have verse 24 here, but we're going to see that, so God subdued on that day Jabin king of Canaan before the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So, so within this movement, Jabin has to be defeated in 2023. He has to be subdued. But there's still going to be a work to do, but that's going to be us giving a message. Because that spirit still exists outside of the movement. Because, you know, notice it's going to go back to Jabin here, even though Sisera is dead. Right? Which they have in 22. And, and I would just take this section here. Um, uh, going on, right? Because we're going to be brought with that 10,000, we're going to be brought to 2017. And, and we're going to see this whole story of Sisera is this history going up to 2023. Anyway, that's the way I look at it, whether that's, you know, 
maybe I'm trying to be read something into it. But, but I just don't see that I can see it any other way, at least not at this point. It just seems to fit too much. This brings us, as we're going to go through the next chapter, mm. it's, going, it's going to bring some other things into focus, especially with that chapter and its succeeding chapters. Yeah, so, so tomorrow you're going to bring your notes on Judges chapter 5 and we'll start going through it with your notes. Okay. I think that's what we should do. And we, we will keep coming back to Judges chapter 4 because it's going to be constantly referenced here. Right. So I think we'll, we'll be able to see it more clearly once we go through Judges chapter 5. And we might correct some of our understanding here. But Judges chapter 5 is going to go back to, to other histories. It's going to ref, refer to Shamgar again and things like that. So, okay. Well, let's close with the word of prayer. And then uh, tomorrow, Dwight will pick up the study again. That's okay, Dwight. I'll be ready. Okay. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, uh, for your time uh, that you have spent with us this morning. And for um, the conviction that you bring upon us. We know, Lord, that um, there's much that we do not know. But we know that you are leading us. And that you have a message for us. So we pray that you can help us to study these things on our own. Be with those who are watching these videos. May you continue to bless them, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.